Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. I'm a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large of America Media, and author of the book Building a Bridge, and we're going to watch some popular representations of my boss, Jesus. So someone's doing somersaults. Apparently all the, wow, I've forgotten this, that the disciples are also acrobats. But hey, you never know. Now there he is. Very groovy. You know, I actually liked this when it came out. You know, I thought this was actually very good in terms of uh, depicting how the crowds would have uh, tried to make Jesus into kind of a famous person. In the Gospels, they talk about Jesus' fame going from place to place. So I think it's actually pretty accurate in a very contemporary way. You know, one of Jesus' temptations is to kind of resist the crowd's desire to make him into the king. And also, as they're saying, to make him into a revolutionary. Yeah, I'm a fan, frankly. Some people have said it's blasphemous. I don't think it's blasphemous at all. It's a kind of reimagining of the Jesus story and trying to make it contemporary. And it, I think it expresses very well the themes of the way that the crowds uh, did, in fact, according to the Gospels, approach Jesus and how he had to distance himself from that desire to make him king. This is a great scene, actually. I remember this scene. So poor Ben-Hur doesn't get to drink. I think he's a galley slave by this point. Someone asked once if uh, what it was like directing Charlton Heston, and I think one director said he was so wooden it was like directing lumber. I have to say, I really like this scene. It's very simple. Jesus is always talking about doing simple things for people, giving a drink to the thirsty. I think it's very artful that they don't show his face. So a little bit of foreshadowing, so he doesn't get water on the cross from the Roman centurions. Now that part I, w I found a little much, because he would have looked like just any other Galilean. So this idea that he was kind of, you know, his human appearance was striking is a little much, but maybe the guy is feeling guilty himself. Of course he has beautiful brown hair because this is the 1950s. It's a great scene. It's very simple. You know, in Charlton Heston, Ben Hur says nothing, but you get a sense of his conversion. And you wonder how many people had encounters like that with Jesus that are not recorded in the Gospels, right? Nothing miraculous, but a kind of encounter. Jesus sees people who aren't usually seen. He makes people who are invisible visible, and that's, that's part of his touch. So Jesus normally is represented as white, uh, which he was not, uh, with beautiful long brown hair, which he probably didn't have. I was just reading an article recently about his appearance. He would have probably been much shorter. Uh, he would have been Middle Eastern looking, obviously, with maybe dark curly hair and probably nothing uh, particularly impressive about him. Uh, he's a carpenter, so he would have been probably a you know, strongly built guy. But uh, when he starts uh, preaching uh, in Galilee, people say, who is this? This is just the carpenter. So, so in terms of his human appearance, there was probably nothing special. He's, he's ordinary. I mean, God becomes an ordinary human being, which is why the fact that he's, he's the son of God is so surprising to people um, back then and now. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Max von Sydow, greatest story ever told. Very intense, Jesus. It's very um, artfully done, too. The, it's almost like a Caravaggio painting. And I think this is at the Last Supper. Yeah, so it's, it looks like the, um, the Leonardo da Vinci painting, more or less. And he's using the bread that they would have used back then, you know, sort of pita bread. So quoting right from the Gospels and the words we use in Mass today, would have been very familiar to people who would have seen this. I like Max von Sydow because he's very intense in this. You get the sense of Jesus really as the Son of God, the Divine One, where in other movies he's, he's a little bit more human. In this one he is, he is divine. It's, it's called a high Christology. The disciples, as usual, are all white. Which they were not. So you always wonder in these encounters and these passages in the gospel how formal Jesus really was. Did he say it in this very formal way or did he say it in a more conversational way? 
So now they're drinking of his blood. And I think that's Roddy McDowell, maybe, maybe not. I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you. These are all quotes from the Gospels. Yeah, quoting, quoting right from the Gospels. So it's the Last Supper. He's Thursday, Friday, he dies. And they're still probably wondering what's going on. There's a good sense of them not understanding, which of course was the lot of the disciples back then. It's a great shot, very classic. Blue-eyed Jesus. So it's the Last Supper. Uh, it's a Passover meal, most scholars say. And uh, Jesus is breaking bread and sharing wine. And Christians believe it, it becomes his body, his blood. Uh, the disciples aren't understanding what's going on, but this is his farewell meal um, to the disciples before the crucifixion. And again, the question is, which is very beautifully portrayed here, do they understand at all what he's doing? Um, and do they understand what's going on? This is fun. Good, good. I do this all day. My trust is in you. Now, this is dubbed. What I like about the original is that it's in Aramaic. That was one of my favorite parts of the movie. So he's, 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 this is the agony in the garden. And that is Satan coming to tempt him. And you know, this is Jesus' final kind of offer to the Father of obedience. In other words, he feels like He's being called to be crucified or accept the crucifixion and of course the Satan or the evil spirit is telling him that he doesn't need to do that. The only problem with this, these kinds of representations is that Satan is kind of personified, whereas I think it's more interior. Chalice, go from me. One of the great things about this part of the Gospels is that that line, remove this cup from me, let this chalice go for me, it shows Jesus is humanity. He doesn't want, he's not courting death. He doesn't want to be crucified. But then he ultimately accepts uh, the Father's will. Somehow he intuits that. I found this movie very powerful, a little too violent uh, for my taste. Uh, I thought the emphasis on the crucifixion was a little excessive. You know, I would have liked to have seen more about his ministry. Uh, you know, someone pointed out that uh, Jesus would have been just another uh, uh, kind of criminal to the Romans, they wouldn't have focused so much on him. And so I think the, the movie makes it look a little too much like he's the, you know, the kind of the worst criminal that, that had ever lived and the Romans really, uh, you know, kind of had it in for him, which they did, but not kind of just him. Uh, and I, I found it a little too gory. But what I liked about it was that it was very authentic. I love the fact that he spoke in Aramaic and, you know, and the crucifixion was brutal. And I think one of the things that this movie did for people is remind people that, you know, it wasn't the kind of uh, sanitized crucifixion that we often see in movies, that it really was very bloody. Uh, and there are signs in the Gospels of that. So I thought it was a, a needed corrective to, to some of the movies, but again, maybe a little too gory for my particular taste. But I actually thought Jim Caviezel did a great job in this. Ah, South Park. Bene, bene de gale. Lock and load. <laughs> I don't know what I could say about that other than clearly that is not the Jesus that I know. In a sense, I don't get too offended about this. I mean, Jesus is part of uh, our culture in the United States, is part of popular culture in the United States, so it's not surprising that he shows up on South Park. Sometimes in South Park he says smart things, sometimes in South Park he does dumb things like take a gun and says lock and load, but it is satire after all, so I don't think we're expecting you know, commentary on the Gospels from, from uh, South Park. I don't know that too many people get their idea of who Jesus is from South Park, and if they do, they're gonna be sadly mistaken when they get to heaven. So now, one of my favorites. The Annunciation scene from the Gospel of Luke, and uh, it's Mary's encounter with the angel, and it's done so beautifully. So that's Mary. She's asleep in her little town of Nazareth. She probably would have been 14, 15 at the time. This is Elizabeth Hussey, who was a little older. And the sort of uh, shutter on the window opens up and a light comes onto her. And this is, this is the angel, which you do not see. It's really beautiful. So she's afraid, Mary's afraid, just as in the Gospels. That's her mother, Anne, who wakes up. 
here's something, doesn't see anything. She just sees the light. It's one of my favorite scenes. Who are you? So you hear just her side of the conversation. It's really very clever. More or less right from the Gospels. So the angel's speaking to her now, saying that you're going to bear a child. So Anne doesn't see anything. So right from the Gospels. So you're going to bear a son. How can that be, she says. And then he gives her an explanation. The power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, meaning it's going to happen miraculously. And the angel reminds her that her cousin, who was thought to be barren, is now with child, kind of proof of what God can do. And then in the Gospels it says, and then the angel left her. But it's true. Isn't that great? It's like she right, didn't have a son. Right from a Renaissance painting. The scripture scholar William Barclay, who's a Scottish scripture scholar, worked on this script with uh, Zeffirelli, um, and so it's, it's quite accurate, and it's really taken right from the Gospels. It's a beautiful, I think it's probably the most uh, sort of faithful to the Gospels, and it's my favorite. How blessed are those whose hearts are pure. So this is the Sermon on the Mount, but unfortunately people are too far to hear him. <laughs> That's uh, Brian and the Virgin Mandy. So you never have any idea like what the crowds were like back then. So who knows, maybe they were arguing like this. Now I didn't mind this movie because, you know, you have Brian who's separate from Jesus. So we know that it's not Jesus. But they are actually listening to Jesus right now. This is my favorite line. Uh, Blessed the cheesemakers they hear. What's so special about the cheesemakers? And the other guy says, it's not meant to be taken literally. It refers to any manufacturer of dairy products which someone said that he's the first theologian, he's interpreting things. Now they just argue. You know, one thing that I think about this is that, all right, how much of what Jesus said are we just hearing? You know, I, there are parts of the life of Brian that I find offensive, like the uh, crucifixion. Most of it I find hilarious. This is my favorite scene. And frankly, uh, I've been to the Holy Land many times and to the Mount of the Beatitudes where this was where, where, by tradition, Jesus proclaimed the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And I never fail to think of Blessed are the Cheesemakers. I think The Life of Brian is one of the funniest movies ever made, and I enjoy seeing it. I, I have a hard time watching the ending, and I really, I turn it off before the, uh, the singing uh, on the, the uh, crucifixes, always look at the bright side of life. I just, I, I can't go there as a Christian. I can't go there to sort of make fun in any way of the crucifixion. But, the rest of it is actually an interesting commentary um, on uh, discipleship, uh, on Christianity, uh, and, and just on human nature. So it's, I, I find it mostly uh, very enjoyable. And if you, they could cut the last scene out, it would be uh, up there with my favorite uh, Jesus movies. So it's a truism that uh, every age needs its own Jesus, right? And you see the different representations of Jesus. Uh, uh, you know, very white, uh, very uh, sort of social justice-y, very revolutionary, very calm, uh, funny in some ways. And, um, you know, you look in the Gospels, and the Gospels present us with different versions of Jesus. I think anything that enables us to get closer to who Jesus was is fine, uh, within limits, of course. Um, my favorite is uh, Jesus of Nazareth, but that's probably because uh, I watched it when I was a teenager and it made a really good impression on me. So I would say to people, just be open. Uh, to different interpretations of Jesus and give it a, a wide berth because in general most of these filmmakers are are trying to do a good job.